like to thank uh, Ibrahim Dawush and uh, Bukhet Bora for uh, organising uh, this event this evening. And I know it's going to be a very interesting one. We're honoured to have Professor Yilmaz Esmer, who's going to speak to us a little bit uh, today about uh, issues of values and, and politics and, and political culture. Uh, he's an expert in this, particularly with the focus on on Turkey. Uh, he was the principal investigator for Turkey of the World Values Survey project uh, that has been since 1990 and has served on the executive committee of the World Values Association. Professor Esmer, Esmer has also conducted many surveys on Turkish public opinion and I think we're confident in saying there's nobody better uh, than Professor Esmer to, to talk about where Turkey is today and where it's going in terms of its mindset, its set of values, beliefs, and the overall political mood. So in that context, uh, it's absolutely topical uh, for the debate today to be Turkish democracy today. Yet another test of dem democracy without Democrats. Uh, and there has been, of course, a lot of uh, focus, a lot of debate and discussion recently around what's happening in Turkey. It's uh, an absolutely critically important country for Europe and for the entire uh, global community and, and particularly work with what's happening around the refugee crisis. Uh, and Turkey really has been uh, in the public eye and, and therefore we do look forward to hearing uh, the professor uh, uh, and to give us some insights and some perspective on what's going on in that extremely important country, both geopolitically, but also in terms of the regional and global economy. So, over to you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Kenneth, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I hope I won't disappoint you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, I suppose it's customary to start the talk with a joke, but it seems like Turkish democracy is not, no longer a joking matter. So, I'll pass that. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, when we say Turkish democracy today, I think democracy should be in quotation marks. Uh, that is an unfortunate state of affairs, but one has to be objective, I suppose. Uh, I suppose most of you have been following the recent process of, I'm not going to say election, but selection, of a new leader of the ruling party, Justice and Development Party. Uh, and I understand the new government has been announced today, but that whole process really is uh, not what we quite understand when we say a democratic process. Just one, uh, one candidate declared about a couple of days before the meeting elected unanimously, so on and so forth. But you know the details of that, so I won't go into that. Uh, but I thought I would start by giving you some data about international organizations, uh, ratings and rankings of Turkish democracy in a comparative perspective. Uh, so I started up, I, I will start up with the most popular one of those, the Freedom House uh, ratings of Turkey. As you know, Freedom House has a rating of all the countries in the world. They have had that for a long time, for many, many years. And unfortunately, Turkey's ratings have been going down in recent years, not going up, but going down. That is less, and Turkey is being classified as less free and less democratic. And here are some examples here. Uh, of course, the lower the score in Freedom House ratings, the better it is in terms of a democratic and free uh, system of government. UK has a rating of 111, civil liberties, political rights, and the average rating. 
and so does Germany, Sweden, Chile, South Korea. Well, no, South Korea has a mixed rating there. Then comes South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Mozambique, and then Turkey. Uh, that is somewhat disappointing. Now, clearly, there are many, many methodological concerns about Freedom House ratings. And rightly so, I believe. They've been criticized uh, often for their subjective ratings. But nevertheless, okay, half a point down, a quarter of a point up, or whatever. But on the whole, they do give an idea about the position of Turkey and the international community with respect to civil liberties, political freedoms, and, of course, uh, political rights. But there is more. There are so many of these international and quite respectable agencies. Uh, let's take a look at one more, for example. There is just out now, fresh <laughs> out from the oven, is the rule of law index that has been uh, world justice. It's a project of the world justice project, rule of law index. And that relies, as you can see there, on over 100,000 household and expert surveys to measure how the rule of law is experienced in everyday life around the world. Performance is assessed through 44 indicators organized around eight themes. Constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, open government, fundamental rights, order and security, regulatory enforcement, civil justice, and criminal justice. And then, no, <laughs> Denmark has the highest score there, as you can see, and is ranked number one in the world. Actually, all these indices have Scandinavia at the very top. Uh, Northern Europe, Northwestern <coughs> Europe, and then the US, and then the rest of the world, usually. You've got there Denmark, ranking number one, the UK, 12, Chile, 26, United Arab Emirates, 27, Botswana, 31, South Africa, 36, Zambia, 78, Burkina Faso, 78, and Turkey with a ranking of 8. And this is, as I have said, the World Justice Project. Again, you can criticize these rankings with respect to their methodology and all that, but nevertheless, okay, not 80th, but let's say 70th. Okay, 65th, or whatever, you know, I'll give you that. But nevertheless, you can see that the picture overall is not right at all. The next one is the Democracy Ranking Index. Okay, and this is an outfit out of Vienna. Uh, again, a very respectable group of uh, academics who rank countries with respect to their democracies. And you can see the rankings there and also the respective scores for each country. Uh, Turkey is ranked 69th behind Ghana, Namibia, Senegal. You can find other examples, but these are the more striking ones that I have chosen. And you can see the scores for two, uh, 2010 and 11 uh, versus the most recent scores. And Turkey has gone, the rank of Turkey, the ranking of Turkey has gone down by seven places during that period of four years or so, four or five years. Uh, again, the picture is not looking right. The next one and the last one, <coughs> I promise, I mean, you know, I don't want to 
bore you with <laughs> numbers. Uh, I'm sure you've memorized them all by now. Uh, the next one, you've got some more memorization to do, is the Economist Intelligence Unit Democracy Index. I'm sure you're more familiar with the Economist's indices here. And they have the overall score, of course, but also electoral process and pluralism, functioning of government, political participation, and of special interest to me and for the topic of uh, this evening's talk, they also have a ranking, a score of political culture. And in a minute I'm going to try to show that political culture and, for example, the functioning of government in any given country are closely correlated. Uh, the Economist has four categories for regimes with respect to democracy. Uh, the first is obviously full democracies, fully democratic regimes. Then they have what they call flawed democracies, democracies with a, some sort of a flaw, not completely fully democratic, but flawed, as they call them. The third category is what they call hybrid regimes. And then they have the authoritarian regimes as the fourth category. Well, you can see that, for example, with respect to civil liberties, Turkey's score there is miserably low. 2.94, whereas Norway scores 10 out of 10. The UK is 9.41, and you can see the rest. With respect to the functioning of government, on the other hand, the score is somewhat respectable. Uh, but when you look at the overall score, Turkey is 97th with respect to its ranking. Something needs to be done, obviously. And more critically, I suppose, is the fact that, as I mentioned in one instance, but this is a generalization that one can easily make, the scores, according to all of these international organizations, the scores have been going down. In other words, Turkey is becoming less free and less democratic. At least that has been their evaluation for the last five years, six years, whatever. So the next thing that I would like to talk about is how is political culture related to that? In other words, what's responsible for this? Because many people are of the opinion that it's the institutions. It's the leader or leaders. It's the laws and the constitutions that are usually responsible for the characteristics of the regime. I beg to disagree. Yes, people who defend that position are in distinguished company, no doubt. Uh, but I do think, I do believe that people's mentality is a more important factor. Which brings me to the topic of this evening's talk, which is, another t is this another test of the democracy without Democrats hypothesis? But let's look at a simple correlation first. The Pearson correlation, uh, well, uh, <coughs> as I explained, what that is? Uh, I should. Okay, it's a statistical measure of association, linear association between 
two variables. The two variables in this example are the functioning of government score, according to the economist's intelligence unit, and political culture, again, according to uh, EIU. And that correlation, okay, a correlation of zero means that the, those two factors, those two variables, are independent of each other. They're not related to each other at all. A correlation of plus one is a perfect positive association, meaning that as one increases, the other one tends to increase, and as one decreases, the other one tends to decrease as well. Well, so much statistics is enough. <laughs> what we see from this picture is that political culture is very highly correlated, really, with the functioning of government. In other words, the mentality, the mindset, the political habits of a society are related to, correlated with, uh, the well-functioning of the government in that society. I also have there something called R squared, which is simply the correlation coefficient squared. But it has, a, it has an important interpretation. The interpretation of this R squared, for example, is that 0.44, almost half of the variation in the functioning of government can be explained by political culture. Now, if you're at all familiar with uh, social science statistics, you know that in the social sciences, unlike the natural sciences, we don't get such high degrees of association. And our square of almost 50% is rather unusual uh, in our fields. And so this only says to us, culture matters. And it matters a lot. And it better should, because my whole career is based on that uh, brief statement. <laughs> if culture doesn't matter, then bye-bye everybody, nice knowing you. Uh, OK. so. Having seen that, let's take a look at a couple of statements by prominent political and social scientists. Christian Welzel, a German political scientist, and Ronald Engelhardt, who is the founder of the World Values Surveys, a professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, have written, democracy is fragile when it's a democracy without Democrats. The next question is mine. Can a country sustain a democratic system of government unless a substantial majority of its citizens espouse fundamental democratic values? Now, this is a question for us all to think about, really. A country can establish a government, a democratic system of government, writes a wonderful constitution, and you know, has a beautiful election system, most democratic in the world. Those things can happen. A group of leaders or a group of elites can easily do that, okay, in the beginning. The question is not that. The question is, is that sustainable? If a sizable portion, nobody knows what proportion that is exactly, but nevertheless, a sizable proportion of its citizens are Democrats, which says, well, some of you who are familiar with 
I do have some more time, don't I? I'm just starting. Uh, <laughs> Harold Baswell has said, survival of democratic regimes largely depends on mass beliefs. And a very famous political scientist, late Seymour Martin Lipsitz, has said, modernization helps create mass ori orientations that are conducive to democracy. So he sees a correlation and association between modernization and democracy through mass orientations towards politics, towards freedoms, for example, etc. Okay, so now I am going to make my point here. I am going to say, yes, there have been problems and severe problems. Let's be honest about it, about how the Turkish democracy has been proceeding, not progress. <laughs> I'm not going to say progressing, <laughs> but anyway, how it's been going, okay? But I am also going to say that is not just a legal problem. That is not just a leadership problem. But that is a problem of our mindsets. As you know, Turkey has been trying to write a new constitution for the last six years, seven years, something like that. A lot of people have drafted constitutions and that many civil society organizations, NGOs, have uh, engaged themselves, took it upon themselves to draft a new constitution for Turkey. And it just so happened that I also was invited to a couple of those meetings. I never participated in any one of those exercises. And my answer was always the same. I support the British constitution. <laughs> Thereby trying to <laughs> make my point that you really don't need a constitution. You need the traditions. You need the right mindset. You need the people who respect rules and who respect each other and who respect each other's freedoms and who cares what you write in your laws and in your constitutions. In fact, you may not even have a formal constitution and things will work perfectly well. Uh, so that would be my point. Now, of course, Uh, the next question would be, what is the relationship between Turkey's political culture and the periodic relapses that its democracy experiences? We know that since its establishment, the Turkish democracy has experienced a number of relapses, military takeovers, but also civilian problems, not just military, that would be unfair. But anyhow, how is the relationship, what is the relationship, if any, between that and the mindsets of the people of Turkey? Okay, let's try to go into that. In trying to answer that question, I have tried to define what I call the minimal democrat. Who's a We talked about democracy without democrats. We talked about espousing democratic values. But then we need a more specific definition of that. It's not just enough to say <coughs> Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. Smith is a democrat. What do we mean by that? Uh, and my minimal Democrat says this person, and I thought in the beginning that was a minimal definition. Was I an optimist? Uh, it turned out that this was, in fact, more than a maximum definition. The minimum definition, I thought, should include having faith in democracy as a system, as defining as is the best possible system of government. 
compared with other options. Not perfect by any means, but compared to the other options, the best possible form. Have faith in Parliament and elections, okay? And say, this is the most preferred form of government, okay? Second, accept, and if necessary, be willing to engage in conventional, at least, forms of political participation. Okay? You should believe that you should have a say in what's going around you, in your community, in your town, and, of course, in the country as well. You know? How are the decisions taken? Can I participate in that decision-making process in any way, shape, or form? Okay, thirdly, I thought the Democrat should be tolerant of differences, such as race, color, religion, ideology, etc. Okay? Democracy is a regime, I thought, that puts a fundamental emphasis on respecting differences. Fourth, a Democrat should put a high value on basic freedoms. And finally, last but not least, of course, a Democrat should be supportive of gender equality. This is my definition, the minimal definition of a democratic person, a democratic mindset, if you will. Okay? Then let's look at some of the data. Now, when asked, when we asked Turkish people, would it be very good, good, bad, or very bad to have a democratic system of government, 50%, exactly half, said it would be very good. Another 38%, so bringing the total up to almost 90%, let's say, uh, said it would be good or very good. Okay? On the other hand, uh, look at the answers to this question, which is rather disappointing, I'm going to say. I can see it, thanks. <laughs> okay. Read the question, please, or I'll read it for you. I'm sorry, at least for you people sitting there in the background. Is this, which, which side is the Tory and which side is the Labour side? I should be starting. Like like this is Labour. Oh, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm with me also. So then, then the numbers are not right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more over there than over there. Oh, I see. It should be. Okay. okay. <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure that I'm standing on the right you're side. You're in the opposition bench. I see. <laughs> I've always been on my oh, life. I know. Well, you're an academic, so you have to be. <laughs> okay. Would it be very good or good, okay, to have a strong leader who does not have to bother with parliament or elections? A very specific question. For our country, would it be good or bad? Then there are gradations of it. Very good, very bad, etc. To have a strong leader. Okay, I don't want you. I don't want to remind you of Turkey today. Uh, has nothing to do with that. Strong leader who does not have to bother with parliament or elections, and. It's a 